Okay, brilliant. Um, so without further ado, uh, hi, welcome. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we're really excited to be hosting uh, the online launch of uh, Justin Jock's Revolutionary Mathematics. Um, we were really lucky at Autonomy to get an early sighting of the book a few months ago when we discussed it internally. We really enjoyed it and found it really productive. So we've been really keen to get uh, Justin, Justin on to talk about it and to open up for questions with our sort of wider networks. So we're really glad you joined us. We'll have a really productive uh, conversation and event. Um, so just, I'll give a really quick rundown of the format we'll be um, following uh, over the next uh, 90 minutes or so, and then I'll give a few introductions and then we'll really quickly um, get underway and allow um, uh, Justin to, to kick us off. So, um, so yeah, so first of all, um, after this, I'll give Justin 20, 30 minutes to uh, give an outline of some of the book's central arguments and main themes, uh, particularly for those of you who might not have had a chance to uh, take a look at the book yet. Yeah. I'll then hand over to Sonia and James who will give some quick responses and raise some questions for further discussion. I'll turn it back to Justin uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience for, um, for questions. Um, there, um, so um, following that we'll be able to open up to audience questions so you can either use the raise hand function or type some uh, questions in the chat and I'll try and pick some questions up uh, as we go and hand them over to our panel. But um, without further ado, um, actually no, I'll give, without further ado, I'll give some really quick introductions and then hand over to Justin. So um, Justin, our author, um, uh, researches philosophy, technology and media, is a visualization librarian at the University of Michigan. Um, he's also the author uh, of the book we're discussing today, Revolutionary Mathematics, Artificial Intelligence, Statistics and Logic of Capitalism, and has previously authored Deconstruction Machines, Writing in the Age of Cyberwar. Uh, Sonia uh, is a researcher for um, autonomy in our autonomy data unit, uh, where they work on combining and refining different data sets to produce digital tools uh, for research and building imaginative emancipatory responses to the future of work. She holds a PhD in mathematics from Maynooth University uh, and a research where her research specialty lies in geometry and discrete optimization and informs her work at autonomy. Um, and finally, we have James, um, James Meadway, who's an economist his work is focused on developing viable alternatives to neoliberalism and is published widely on democratic ownership, environmental econ economics, automation and the digital economy. Um, uh, he was previously economic advisor to the Shadow Chancellor, but is now a director of the Progressive Economic Forum. Brilliant. So everyone will have a chance to speak very shortly, but without further ado, I'll hand it over to Justin to get us underway. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jack, and uh, thank you everyone at, at Autonomy for the invitation. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, James and Sonia, especially for uh, being willing to, to respond um, and for their comments. And, and thank you all for, um, for being here, obviously. Um, I feel like giving, given the events of the last 24 hours, I wish my research was uh, more relevant and I had something meaningful to say about what's happening in Ukraine. Um, but I, I think I, I will just say that, you know, of course, we should all um, oppose imperialist wars whenever and however uh, possible and, and leave it at that and then uh, get to the, uh, the question of, of probability and mathematics and, and capitalism. Um, so let me uh, share my screen really quickly. I have a few slides. So hopefully you all can see that. Um, so I don't, I mean, I, I will uh, certainly uh, give sort of an overview of the central argument of the book, um, but, but rather than simply sort of rehearsing uh, what's in the book and, and what you can all read there, um, I wanna try in the, in the time that I have to give a little bit of context sort of, of, of what I was trying to do with the book, a little bit of sort of uh, the kind of history that, that uh, led to the book and, and what I'm, I'm hoping that the book ultimately um, ends up doing or at least doing part of. So, you know, uh, when I wrote this, there is, oh, sorry, here I should show you all. This is the, this is the book, Revolutionary Mathematics, Artificial Intelligence, Statistics, 
uh, and the Logic of Capitalism. It's uh, by Verso and it's available. You can order it directly from Verso uh, where things seem to always be 30 to 40% off. Um, so probably the best place is to order it directly from their website. But of course you can find it um, other places. And so there's been over you know, the past uh, decade or so, there's sort of been an extensive discourse um, about algorithm and especially about uh, algorithmic bias and, and how they uh, work and for whom they work and, and whom they don't work. Um, you know, some notable ones are, are these by uh, Sophia Noble, Kathy O'Neill, uh, Virginia Eubanks, focusing on sort of uh, inequality uh, and the, the harms of algorithms. And so while in some ways uh, the book that, that I wrote was uh, interested in sort of these questions of, of how algorithms work and, and there's quite a bit of, of that in there as well. The question I was sort of really struck by was, was what it is that sort of gives algorithms their kind of their force, how it, it is that, that they sort of have this tendency to, to think for them. And I think one sort of somewhat local event, I'm, I'm located in, in Michigan, uh, that's really sort of shaped my, my thinking very early on um, about algorithms was this debacle around uh, MIDAS, which was the Michigan uh, Data Automation System, I think is, it stands for something like that. And it was it's essentially a system for uh, managing uh, unemployment uh, uh, benefits in the, in the state and it was developed, I think, by a, a private company and the, the state bought it for a couple million dollars. Um, and one of the things that, that it was supposed to do was to automatically detect uh, unemployment fraud. So if people you know, weren't supposed to be getting unemployment benefits, but they were claiming them and it would kick them automatically off of it, uh, which, was, which had been done sort of uh, you know, manually by a fraud investigation unit. Um, and there was actually, there was an error in the software. It wasn't, it wasn't really one of these cases necessarily of, of bias per se. It was just the software flat out didn't work. And, and some 40,000 people who should have gotten unemployment uh, were kicked off of it. And there was, there was because of the fact that they had sort of dismantled this fraud investigation unit in favor of the software, um, there was no sort of process to, uh, um, to contest these results. And so people, some of the people, some of these 40,000 people, it took them, you know, three, four years before they got the money. There was, this was, I just pulled this, this article from Time Magazine. Um, and it was, there was this case of these people who, uh, you know, eventually three, four years later, they got $6,000, but they had already, you know, their credit had been destroyed. They couldn't get a mortgage, a car, rent an apartment. Um, you know, these are, are people in very precarious situations who can't wait uh, three years for their unemployment insurance. And so I think this event and, and other sort of similar events really got me thinking um, less about what particularly it is that's sort of going on behind the, the mask of the algorithm, but this sort of this kind of political social power that we have, have sort of vested um, in them and the ways in which they, they make um, decisions for us. And so sort of simultaneously, I, or I've, I've long really been interested in the way that, uh, that Marx, especially in Capital, um, talks about objectification. And it, it struck me that there was something very sort of similar uh, going on here. And oftentimes I think when we, uh, when we talk about objectification, I think we tend to think about it in this sort of this uh, more modern kind of pop way uh, that it has to do with treating people like objects. Um, but if you go back to capital, uh, what Marx um, says there is, is, is slightly, but I think in a very important way, uh, uh, different. And then uh, I'll explain what this has to do with algorithms uh, uh, quite shortly. But he says there, uh, and he says here, I'll just read this quote. He says, there it is a definite, there it is a definite social relation between men that assumes in their eyes the fantastic form of a relation between things. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must have recourse to the mist-enveloped regions of the religious world. In that world, the productions of the human brain appear as independent beings endowed with life and entering into relation both with one another and the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the product of men's hands. And so to my mind, what Marx is saying is, is objectification is less about treating people like objects and more about the ways in which we ask objects to think for us and account for our affairs and sort of hold us to account for these, these objective uh, relations. Um, 
And so I think you can sort of start to see maybe, you know, in the, in the case of Midas, the ways in which there is really this sort of objectified force that whether it's right or wrong doesn't necessarily matter. What matters is the fact that this system was able to take away people's unemployment insurance and not pay them. Um, and, and it functions in this objective way, less in the terms of being true or false, but in the terms of sort of being the case that one has, you know, when, when the checks stop coming in the mail, um, one has to deal with that situation. It becomes the sort of objective uh, economic situation one finds themselves in. And, and so, um, so I, I really started thinking uh, a lot about this. And in fact, um, this book in a lot of ways was initially in my mind sort of two separate projects. It was this one project um, about, uh, about objectification and thinking about algorithms as a, a sort of force of objectification. And then I also had in the back of my mind a sort of another project where I was really interested in um, this shift from uh, frequentist statistics to Bayesian statistics and the role that it sort of plays in, um, in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and, I, and, and, and a sort of a shift that in a lot of ways under, underlies a lot of, I, I come really, I think, from, from media studies is where I, I sort of really feel my, my home is. Um, and media studies is very interested in algorithms and, and the things that are happening, um, but very little had been written about the shift from frequentist to Bayesian statistics. And so I, I sort of had these kind of these two questions about this, this sort of shift in understanding of probability and this question of objectification. And as they were kind of developing, um, I realized that in, in very sort of specific and interesting ways, they were sort of talking about uh, uh, the same problem. Um, and so the book sort of uh, came together, bringing these sort of, you know, rubbing these two sticks together uh, to try to, to create something. So with this sort of uh, question of um, objectification in mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about the sort of the history of um, probability in the 20th century, um, and then we'll tie it back into um, this discussion about objectification. Um, so just to give you a, a little bit of, of context, and then I'll talk a little bit about the sort of the specific history of how we get from frequentist statistics um, to Bayesian statistics. Um, but there's sort of, uh, I love this quote from Michael Lynch, who's the founder of, uh, oh, I, I didn't even put this together, a different autonomy uh, uh, quite a, a number of years ago in terms of internet time um, that uh, I think was Hewlett Packer or some other company bought them uh, in the, in the mid 2000s. Uh, but anyway, so they were doing some early uh, artificial intelligence work. And, and he says that Bayes gave us a key to a secret garden a lot of people sort of looked around and shut the gate, but they didn't realize that there's this new country stretching out behind these roses with the new super powerful computers. We can explore that country. And I think increasingly we see not only uh, exploration, but uh, massive investments in extracting uh, value from, uh, from that country. And so in a lot of ways, uh, there's, there's really been this kind of this uh, Bayesian revolution as we've shifted into, into Bayesian statistics. And, and obviously uh, a number of the machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence algorithms are not um, strictly Bayesian in their sort of approaches. Some of them are, are various sort of optimization functions. Um, but I still think that this sort of this, this kind of intellectual shift that, that I'll, I'll outline for you all um, really kind of underlies this even when people don't you know, explicitly uh, state their intention as, as being one of, of Bayesian statistics. Okay, so what exactly does does this sort of this shift from frequentist statistics to Bayesian statistics mean? Um, I think that that in order to really sort of grasp it and try to grasp it in its kind of its most important uh, level, it's important to point out that that fundamentally what what I'm interested in discussing is the sort of the metaphysics of probability. Um, that obviously the sort of the math and the calculations one runs sort of follows um, precisely from that. Um, but there's this sort of what exactly probability is, is a very open question. I think it's one of these things where the, the math is quite settled. We know how to do the probability calculus. Um, but what exactly it means to say that an event is, uh, is uh, 
is you know 70 percent likely that it's going to rain is, is quite a tricky thing on a, a philosophical level right because in you know in the real world either it rains or it doesn't rain it doesn't you know 70 percent uh rain so at a certain sort of level outside of uh quantum mechanics there really is no such thing as as probability it it, it really is this sort of um metaphysical system in the, the sort of the strictest sense. It's this kind of this intellectual uh, apparatus that's added on to a set of, of you know, effectively deterministic um, physical systems. And so Leonard Savage, uh, one of the sort of key people in the, the sort of early years of the modern Bayesian revolution uh, says, as to what probability is and how it's connected with statistics, there's seldom been such complete disagreement and breakdown of communication since the Tower of Babel. And I think oftentimes people, you know, uh, pretend that they have a, a very clear idea of, of what probability is, but I think it's important to note that it, it is in a lot of ways a, a very sort of open question as to exactly um, what it is that probability uh, means. So, okay. Uh, so with that said that we're sort of interested in this kind of this uh, metaphysical question of, of what probability is, um, we can, can sort of go back a little in history and, and talk a bit about the early days of frequentism, uh, which was really founded by uh, this guy, Ronald Fisher, who was employed initially as an agricultural researcher at Rothamsted Experimental Station in Eastern England during the interwar period. Um, and Fisher developed a system for experimental design upon which most of the sort of hypothesis testing, the sort of thing uh, that you learn in a, in a college uh, stats class is based on. And frequentism, where it draws its name and its sort of understanding of probability, understands probability as the sort of the long run frequency of some event. So uh, you flip a coin a hundred times, if it's, if it's half heads, half tails, then the probability of heads is 50%. Um, and, and the question that, that Fisher was really trying to answer was if you, if you see some difference between two things, let's say, you know, because he was, uh, doing this early agricultural research, we could say between one fertilizer and the other, um, what is the odds that this has to do with chance and what is it that it has to do with a, a sort of a real distinction, uh, between the fertilizers. And so Fisher's answer to this is, um, that we set up an experiment and we evaluate the sort of the two different populations or the two fertilizers, um, and then we compare them. But somewhat counterintuitively, he asks um, sort of the opposite question of what we really want to know. And he asks and he says, okay, if they, so we have this data, we have, you know, the soybeans a little bit taller in this field, less tall in this field. And he says counterintuitively, if if there is in fact no difference between these fertilizers, what is the probability that we observe the taller soybeans in, in one field? And, and so it, it doesn't actually directly address the question of whether or not the fertilizers are different, but it gives us some sort of evidence uh, one way or another. And the most important thing I, th I think for, for present purposes is that in a sort of strictly Fisherian understanding of probability, um, one can't assign a probability to an individual event, right? If you know, if uh, someone, if Hillary Clinton's going to win the election, or Donald Trump saying giving some probability to that is in this sort of Fisherian uh, system nonsensical because there is no long run frequency. Um, so in a lot of ways, it, it's a very sort of constrained um, system for doing uh, experimental different or experimental uh, testing, and and one has to sort of set up this experiment, have the different populations. It's very much uh, invested in detecting difference, and I, I think and I, I talk about this more at length in the book, but I think it's important to note that Fisher was an avowed eugenicist, and so I think you can see there's this sort of uh, political relationship between this sort of commitment to detecting group level difference uh, and his his politics um, that I, I think is, is very important uh, to note and to remember sort of especially as we think about uh, the, the current uh, situation. So following um, this sort of uh, very constrained understanding of, of probability that we get in Fisher, uh, these two guys, Neyman and Pearson, uh, Egon Neyman, or sorry, Egon Jersey Neyman and Egon Pearson uh, come along and, and they sort of recognize the sort of shortcomings and they try to make things a bit more automatic um, by saying that what you can do is you can calculate the cost if you know, you know what it means to be wrong in either direction. So either to assume that the fertilizer works when it doesn't or assume it doesn't work when it does. And you know if you sort of put it in this kind of economic system, 
um, you can figure out what the sort of the most uh, profitable action to take is. And so they, they term this uh, behavioral induction. And so it's less about being, you know, really determining um, the truth, but sort of being right enough times that you can, you can make um, enough money. And I, I won't dwell on it too much, but it, it's sort of interesting. And I spend a bit of time on it in the book that the sort of the, the Fisherian approach and the Naaman and Pearson approach sort of get mashed together in the 50s and 60s um, into this sort of philosophically uh, nonsensical system. That's really what's oftentimes taught in intro to, um, to stats classes. And for a number of reasons, this sort of this kind of this system of, of hypothesis testing um, isn't isn't doing so well these days. You see all the the news about replication crises in the in the sciences. Um, it's it's expensive and difficult to set up these sorts of experiments. Um, you know, you can just by looking at how long it's taken to approve vaccines, which are, are still very much done in, in this sort of uh, this system. You can see how sort of long and expensive the process is. Um, and so the, this kind of this sort of this crisis uh, in in the sciences, along with uh, large real time data streams that can sort of continually be processed um, and supercomputers or, or even our small laptops and phones these days that have enough processing power to process them. Um, it's really created the conditions for for what we could call the, the Bayesian revolution. Um, so the history of Bayesian analysis dates back to the 18th century, the work of, of the Reverend Thomas Bayes, pictured here, uh, and later Pierre Simon Laplace. Um, but it, it really wasn't until the last sort of 30 or 40 years um, with the advent of, of uh, modern computing um, that this analysis has, has really sort of come into its own. Um, in part, that's because it's, it's relatively simple to do Bayesian statistics, but it's, it's pretty computationally intensive. So it's, it's, it's quite well suited for um, computing. Uh, and I think it's worth sort of noting that one place that it's really stayed alive in the early 20th century, despite the sort of the kind of the prevalence of uh, frequentist and uh, sort of the Fisherian approach is uh, in actuarial science. So insurance adjusters really kind of, um, in a lot of ways, kept the Bayesian flame uh, alive. And, and I think, you know, it, it has something to do with the fact that they were, uh, their analyses really kind of got down to brass tacks very quickly because you could tell if you were, uh, losing or making money. And they also kind of sort of constantly had to adjust uh, insurance rates as new information and new data uh, came in. So there are a number of philosophical differences between Bayesian statistics and Fisher's frequentism. Um, there are multiple interpretations of, of all of these, so I'll, I'll simplify it a little bit. Um, but one of the, the sort of main uh, differences is that rather than seeing probability as this sort of objective long run frequency of some system, um, here probability measures the, the subjective belief in something. So, you know, how much I think it's likely uh, that, it will <coughs> that it will rain. And I think it's important to point out um, that subjective here doesn't really necessarily mean in this kind of uh, relativist sort of way that people oftentimes say subjective. And I think it has something much more to do um, with the fact that it's, it's, um, it's based on one sort of subject position, right? It's based on the data and knowledge that one has in a sort of specific um, location sort of in a, you know, network of, of information and data that's coming in. Um, in a, a certain sort of interesting way, I think it, it has more similarities to do with sort of standpoint epistemology than, um, than some other things, right? That it, it has to do with precisely where an individual is standing. And in a lot of ways, oftentimes what that actually means is where a computer is sitting and the data streams um, that it has access to. Um, so second, rather than centering finite experiments that are designed to tell us some sort of enduring truth about uh, group level difference, um, it provides a framework to constantly update beliefs as new data arrives. Um, so, you know, as new ad revenue comes in, uh, as geopolitical situations change, these probabilities are sort of constantly in flux and being updated, delivering, you know, the, the ad that someone needs, the search result that someone needs, potentially, uh, you know, whether or not someone should continue to receive unemployment insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And then third, and finally, in contradistinction to frequentism, 
probabilities here can be directly assigned to hypotheses and single events because it's just this sort of measure of belief. Um, and this is how we get those sort of, you know, those, those uh, heart attack inducing election night live prediction needles that swing back and forth uh, as more data and news comes in, because obviously this is just about a single um, event. Um, and so, well, frequentism sort of grounds the basic mathematics of probability in this run, in this long run, really existing objective frequency. Um, when free, when probability becomes sort of subjective in the sense that that the Bayesianists mean it, um, it becomes more difficult to sort of find a kind of solid ground for it because it's not this sort of this objective thing that can be um, measured. And while there are sort of multiple uh, justifications for Bayesian statistics, um, one of the sort of most compelling kind of ones that stuck around is what's known as the Dutch book argument, um, which allows you to essentially derive the basic laws of the probability calculus from the imagined exchange of betting contracts. Um, I won't go into the math, but you know, if you think a coin is fair, then you would only be willing to take a contract that pays even odds on a coin's uh, flip being heads. Um, so in short, it ultimately grounds the probability in a theory of markets and information-based exchanges. So these shifts then align with, and I would even argue allow for, the rise of the algorithmic systems we see today. And instead of using data to understand group level difference in this sort of enduring kind of Fisherian way, um, the ability to assign probability to an individual events and hypothesis means that each vis visitor to a website, each convict, each applicant for a job or credits action can be assigned a probability and the most probable outcome can be selected. Analysis ceases to worry about whether a certain population segment or group will pay back a loan and instead ask whether a specific individual will, updating in real time the likelihood that this will happen and the sort of the value of that loan. Um, and so despite, as I said before, Bayesian statistics being subjective, the ability to assign a probability to a hypothesis, each individual hypothesis or an individual event ultimately allows the subjectivity to be automated as algorithms can create essentially a near infinite field of hypotheses from prior data and choose the one with the highest probability. So the ad that you're most likely to click on, uh, the news story you're most likely to read, et cetera, et cetera. And so if Fisher um, was an agriculturalist, then this modern Bayesian or uh, then this modern sort of Bayesian interpretation of probability is, I think, directly a piece with neoliberal digital and the digital and informational world um, that we live in. So Leonard Savage in uh, the 1950s sort of explains this kind of shift that really gets operationalized uh, much later when he says the problem of statistics were almost always thought of as problems of deciding what to say rather than what to do. Though there had already been some interest in replacing the verbalist by the behavioralist outlook here, he's referring to the work of uh, Neyman and Pearson. Um, the first emphasis of the behavioralistic outlook in statistics was, um, oh, sorry, apparently applied by uh, Jersey Neyman. So statistics becomes less sort of about uh, knowledge as this kind of objective thing that the heroic lone scientist knows, and instead becomes something that's determined, you know, by the market and, and able to uh, integrate new sort of information for us. And in this way, to tie it back to what I was saying earlier about Marx and objectification, it becomes this way to think for us, right? It's subjective, but it's subjective in the same way that, that price is subjective at the market, right? You can, you know, you can uh, take your bread to the market. Market and you can say it's worth whatever it, it, whatever you want. It's totally up to you, um, but you still have to deal with the sort of the objective the objective facts of the um, the market. And so I want to clarify that this doesn't mean that that Bayesian statistics are bad. That we should you know resist this sort of Bayesian analysis or attempt to somehow go back to frequentist statistics. I think such a, a, a return is is at this point impossible. Um, I think, in, in fact, the, the takeaway is, is quite the opposite, that, that what uh, Savage and uh, the other sort of early advocates of Bayesian statistics discover is, in fact, a very important, uh, a very important point, and that is that knowledge production cannot be separated from political economy, right? It's not that, that we should imagine some, you know, uh, world where we sort of resist, you know, Bayesian statistics and, and think of, uh, you know, some better uh, statistics 
six, but rather that that all of this sort of knowledge production as it's funneled through Bayesian, Bayesian statistics um, or other forms of machine learning uh, and algorithms, that it is fundamentally subjective. And I think by subjective, we could actually say intersubjective, right? It is about the sort of the networks of people, the social factors and the value that goes into these decisions. And so if scientific knowledge production or knowledge production writ large is in crisis, I think what Bayesian statistics discover, and it's a very important point, is that these are ultimately crises of capitalism and crises of value, that we have, a, that we have this, this challenge of this sort of this system of value that is promoting, um, uh, as I say in the book, sort of dissimulation and enclosure such that it becomes increasingly difficult to understand knowledge and knowledge production because it's tied to this increasingly uh, complex and meaningless and uh, exploitative system of, of value production. And so the, I think the ultimate sort of takeaway of all of this is that is that in order to kind of address these problems, we can't separate out these sort of these questions of stats and knowledge production um, from the larger social and political economic context in which they exist, that they have to sort of be understood as part of these kind of this larger network and these larger systems. And so it's not just a question, I think, of at this point, sort of auditing algorithms or trying to figure out an, an ethical way um, to do algorithms, because I think they're far too complex. I think they're tied into these sort of these complex systems um, that we have to understand their philosophical underpinnings. Um, and sort of uh, the, the risk in these kind of attempts to really sort of show what's really going on behind the mask um, while they can be powerful, I think they risk a sort of a nostalgia for older forms of knowing, a kind of uh, almost sort of uh, knowledge economy version of the sort of back to land movement um, that, you know, is not necessarily bad in and of itself, but that it ultimately does nothing to sort of disrupt the kind of the forces of the market and the ways in which uh, value continues to sort of promote um, uh, these kind of extractive and exploitative uh, ways of, of understanding knowledge and producing knowledge and bringing in all of the sorts of uh, kind of extant forms of domination from racism to sexism uh, to imperialism and laundering them through these sorts of these sorts of algorithms. So in the end, the, the, the sort of the, the largest point is just that really that we have to understand the sort of the, the kind of philosophical underpinnings of these systems and the ways in which they ultimately tie knowledge to the market and to the political economies and societies that produce this knowledge. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Justin. Uh, I'll just, if we end your screen share. Very weekend. Brilliant, kind of a short week. So fantastic. There's huge chance to pick up upon. I think it's it's been great to see people already. Um, there's some really interesting thoughts into the chat already. So we'll definitely um hand over to audience conversation shortly, but we'll just but we will give both Sonia and James, our panelists, a quick chance to add some of their responses first, and then we'll open for a bit more general discussion. So uh, I'll hand over first to Sonia for some reflections, both on what she said, and but also her reading made for book in general and other things she wants to pick up, but um, over to you, Sonia. Uh, thank you, Jack, uh, and thanks, Justin. That was, uh, 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 yeah, it's, um, uh, first of all, I want to say how much I enjoyed reading the book, like every every part of it that I was reading, um, it kind of, it kind of resonated so much uh, with uh, uh, various things I was kind of, uh, you know, the, the, your arguments were tracking a lot of things that I remember, like, I'm not exactly a statistician or a data scientist, so actually most of my uh, professional experiences in, in teaching and uh, like when with the way we educate like children, mathematicians or pe prepare people for these STEM careers, like the, this whole idea of objectification that uh, it kind of had a lot of resonance with, um, with how you teach, I mean, everything you study in mathematics is an abstraction number, uh, a function. None of those things really exist. Um, but uh, but we kind of tell we select for people who are able to deal with these abstractions quite fluidly, and then they come into college and once they get their PhDs, you bring them into a room and then you tell them numbers aren't real. You know, it's 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 like that joke that goes around. So uh, and um, and it's and it, there's like a very interesting kind of trend tension uh, now. I don't know if anybody has been following the math wars where. Uh, where you kind of have people trying to teach mathematics in slightly different ways that could point towards um, 
making a different objectification possible and there's a lot of pushback against it and there's like a lot of resonance with a cold war thinking and like the way some people kind of hit back against trying to teach mathematics in any ways that are are different from this kind of way first you learn how to do the the calculus and then you kind of maybe if for it for as a little treat you can think about uh you know how these systems kind of come into place or what abstractions are or uh, are and like do you have any power in in changing these abstractions? So uh, yeah, the, uh, it was very resonant not just with uh, knowledge production, but also uh, the way we produce knowledge workers. That's uh, one of the things that I thought about. And um, uh, and um, yeah, so and uh, for questions for you, I kind of I was very struck by this this passage in your book about uh, value being always relative. Like the underlying goal of the exchange of contracts is not. To increase knowledge, absolutely, but to know relatively more than the other party the, to the contract. So that's a direct quote from your book, and it's kind of interesting because when you uh, like, if you're if you're working in in mathematics, for example, there is like a dialectical method by which you kind of come to as a proof. You kind of argue and argue against, and but that's quite different from what's what this kind of new knowledge production is bringing it's it's almost an adversarial zero sum almost negative sum game like i mean do you ever feel like the internet is your enemy now like you go onto a website you're fighting your way through uh you're fighting your way through like all these different kind of clickbait and uh, and uh, um, you know like there people are trying to sell you stuff you do not need and stuff that is bad for you it's uh, like this kind of i don't know whether that's like neoliberalism or information capitalism or whatever it is but it's definitely not like building a better mousetrap it's it's a it's a kind of very uh, different kind of system and uh, so yeah so i was wondering whether you have any thoughts like about you know i mean like is, is that also going to be the end of uh, like it, are those the seeds of the destruction of this information capitalism uh, that, uh, you know, like the fact that like even Google is terrible now to use. And um, uh, that's, that's one thing. And um, yeah, another thing, oh, okay. one more thing that I wanted to say was about, it's interesting that you're, you're a database librarian in your day job. That's uh, because uh, one of the ways in which uh, I, I would say maybe the seeds of pointing towards a different way of objectification is to uh, is to maybe kind of look at the way in which people understand things. I mean, like even, you know, you write kind of math papers and stats algorithms in very dry language that machines can understand, but that's not how you communicate. That's not how you absorb ideas. You know, like a lot of, uh, we, uh, we learn things through stories, even like some of the most uh, kind of STEM brained people who try and create, uh, try and want, want to understand the world in terms of like basic rules and like, you know, people like the rationality community, they kind of try and, um, and uh, express themselves, let's say, through like Harry Potter and the methods of rationality is what I'm thinking of, you know, so like people still need to understand things in terms of narratives and stories and, and visualizations and pictures and analogies. But that's not the way in which we write these things down, or that's not the way in which we we objectify them. So, um, so I think that's that's kind of where um, what you quote as the productive tension between abstraction and location comes in. So maybe that's something that we could uh, find a way towards uh, new ways of of, of objectifying. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, am I okay for time for? No, I, I, I think that's fine. There's been loads of really interesting uh, points to it there. So no, uh, if, 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 if you want to finish off that, that's absolutely fine. But uh, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, oh, to okay, right. Fight, oh, finish like, the point. I, I, one more thing that I wanted. So as I said, like every time I was reading it, I, I just, it just kind of, it was very thought provoking. I kind of started thinking in all different directions. So, uh, okay, just, just maybe one more, one or two more anecdotes that uh, I think would be interesting is, I don't know, like a lot of people who follow British politics are familiar with the story about your GDP, where there was like an economist talking talking about, um, you know, oh, well, Britain leaving the EU is going to negatively affect our GDP like this, and somebody from the crowd just yelled, your GDP. Like, and I feel like, I thought that was such an evocative story, kind of just pointed to it, the, the difference between, or the, the contrast between how these objectified measures of what, how the economy is doing, which in itself is an abstraction, is completely, um, uh, when it goes against people's lives, it's, um, uh, but that may be somewhere where we can start thinking about how to actually, uh, you know, come up with different ways of objectification. And also recently there have been like cost of living kind of uh, debates about people saying, well, this is what the cost of living uh, increase is like. And, that in, and 
people pointing out how it doesn't um, really reflect the ways in which people experience cost of living. So, uh, I, so I would just maybe try and uh, finish with three words, people's data movement. Brilliant. Thank Thanks so much for that, Sonia. Um, Justin, I think uh, initially I was going to hand over to, to, to James first. What do you, would you like, um, are you okay hanging on for a minute to respond or, or I'm aware there was plenty of stuff there. So I don't know if you want to jump in first or if you've got a preference. No, why, don't, why don't we let James go and then, because I imagine there'll probably be some resonances and then maybe I can try to sort of tie them together. Sure, that sounds great. James, over to you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and um, resonate. Look, I, I, I want to, I agree with, with Sonia. I really enjoyed um, the book. I mean, it's. I think it's quite short. I got it on a Kindle, so this is a sort of knowledge problem in itself, is that books have no length anymore. It's impossible to tell. But I think it's quite short, but there's an awful lot in there. So it's, um, and, and it's quite like sort of packed in terms of lots and lots of different things to, to, to potentially dig out of it. The one that um, uh, struck me was, was I mean, look, give my background as, as an economist this is this is where it's going to land is is, is precisely this problem around uh, knowledge and production and what is knowledge production are we producing knowledge uh, anyway that uh, picking up on what Sonia said about GDP I mean it's the, the story um, about I think it was uh, it was during the referendum campaign wasn't it it was 2016 and Aditya Chakraborty reported in the Guardian that, that some economist was trying to convince a room full of decidedly sort of leave voting people that if you vote to leave the EU GDP will go down the woman yells that's your GDP you know um, and, and it's a brilliant thing that, that captures the meaningless of, this, of these official statistics in a subjective sense like if you're in Britain now for the last decade longer actually um, GDP has gone up a bit not as fast as it used to, but wages have basically gone down for most people, gone down or stayed about the same over 10 years. So what use is this figure? Right? It doesn't, you know, GDP has gone up, hip, hip, hooray, you're worse off than you were. So who cares? Right. That's, that's what the thing tells you. That's one side of it. The other part of it is, and, and this is where, where I pick up on, I think, something in your book is, is that it is increasingly recognised that GDP itself is a useless number. Now, ever since GDP was invented, um, put together by Simon Kuznets, the first person to really sort of codify how you might count these things back in the 1930s, who insisted, he did try to, the congressional hearing in the US in, what, 1936, he tries to tell the congressional hearing as the US is gearing up to start producing GDP figures, do not use this as a measure of human welfare. It's kind of telling you something about production. It's not necessarily telling you whether you've got a good society or whether people are going to be happy or anything like this. And of course, for the 80 years afterwards, this is exactly how it gets used as a proxy for that. And when you have mass production capitalism, uh, mass consumption capitalism, when you have capitalism that's churning out loads of things that are nice and easy to count, like here is your car or here is your house, GDP works quite well because you can go, that is one car, right? And that is one house. And this is how much we're into making it. And this is what's out the other side. And, and it's fairly easy. As soon as you start getting a whole stack of things that are really quite hard to count and not just count, but price, because as Facebook still tells us, it's free and it always will be. Like you're not being charged, not directly. We can come on to what's really happening. You're not being charged with the use of Facebook. Um, it's really hard to work out what contribution to GDP that is. If you spend all day tweeting angrily at Keir Starmer or the politician of your choice, like what contribution to GDP are you making? What are you actually producing at this point? It's very, very hard to work out what's Twitter actually doing? What's anybody doing here that might add up to something we'd normally understand as a statistic in any way? And, and if you dig out, I mean, it's actually it's a good read. If you like reading about why statistics don't work, I, I realize this is a possibly minority pursuit, but you're all here for the book launch. So um, if you dig out Charles Bean's review of statistics, it goes into some detail that, look, this is just getting worse and worse. All of our numbers built up over the last you know, 100 years or so of, since we've been able to talk about the macro economy, the big picture economy stuff, unemployment, GDP, none of them are working as well. You see the same thing, by the way, coming out of coronavirus, unemployment uh, figures are not working as well as they used to because you know, it gets called a great resignation, but basically a, a lot of people have either decided or had to drop out of the labor market. So suddenly everything looks a bit weird there. These things are falling apart and steering through the middle of this. Uh, and this, I think the book is the point the book makes very well, is a shift away from things that are based on a fundamentally deterministic and at most frequentist view of the world, which is kind of what GDP ends up doing, into something that's much more um, diffuse, 
subjectivist. It's the Bayesian view of if you have a number, the number is not going to be an objective truth in any sense. It's something that can change over time and it will necessarily change over time. And once you start having a world where lots and lots of things are determined like this, most of your big decisions you try and make to control or manage the economy also start to break down. And we're seeing this very, very dramatically on, on GDP. But then that gets you into the question that the book, I think, poses, and, and I think it goes around this. And I'm, I'm not sure you might want to come back in this, but I'm not sure I completely agree with how, how you kind of um, put it, Justin, which is, is that, that what is going on is still a form of knowledge production. That what is being done, if you run a big machine learning computer and you get some results out of your side, it's still a form of something that we would be able to call knowledge in a sense that we think is useful, right? In a sense that we'd go, okay, yes, this is given as a true fact about the world that we can now take and use. It is productive in some sense. It is productive in the sense that you might understand it uh, from sort of economists or, or even a capitalist point of view. And, and that feels like it's not quite where we ought to be looking in this, if that's where the argument ends up, that this isn't really knowledge production. There's in a, a really definite sense, we're actually producing a vast amount of ignorance in sort of two ways in this. I mean, one of them is, is the sort of inherent problem of all, all versions of probability and, and ultimately statistics, but really probability that we have, which is what is this really telling us anyway? Like a frequentist approach to statistics, you say, roll a dice, it's got six sides and you get a number out of six. I mean, presumably there's a tiny chance it just lands like that or something, you don't get anything. But basically you get a number out of six and that's your set of things that can happen. What is this really telling you about what the dice is doing or what, any, what is happening? What is the knowledge that you're generating here? The only thing you've done is specified there is a dice of six sides. You haven't actually said what's going to happen. You've just said this is a set of things that could happen. And then once it has happened, of course, that knowledge of you saying this is a set of things that could happen in the future is no good because it has happened. And you, that's even worse with Bayesianism. There's this problem of like, what is it that you're trying to tell someone if you try and attach a probability to something is, is sort of in, in, inherent uh, to, to, to all of this. And that's reinforced massively once you have machine learning and you are processing vast amounts of data and the machine that has learned something cannot tell you why it is producing its results out the other side. I mean, this is a sort of inherent problem in, in Bayesian methods anyway, that there's no obvious rational in the way we'd normally understand rationality link between the different parts of the system to get you to the result. That this is probabilist, probabilistically determined. It's determined by the data. It's got an inherent kind of subjective element in the sense that you can go round and round and round and redo the thing. You can produce a different result out the other end. And there is no way for this computer that has done this big data processing exercise to tell you how it got to the result at the other end. So is this producing knowledge? And I don't say that as like a grand philosophical question. It strikes me that this starts to have immediate sort of economic implications in that if your measure of GDP is not working because you're investing more and more in this stuff that isn't actually producing knowledge, if you're spending a great deal, you're pumping billions of dollars and pounds and yen, renminbi and whatever else into machines that you don't really know what they're doing and you're all chasing this thing, you know, this is competitive processing capitalism. We end up diverting a lot of energy and attention into this. But you're producing results that you don't know what they are, that you can't price pro properly. There's a large part of it is actively destroying some of the metrics you want to use to try and gauge what the economy is doing. In what sense is this knowledge or production in the way we normally understand it? There's a there's a very good, it's 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 forthcoming, but it's PhDs online. Um, very good paper by uh, uh, an economist, Thomas uh, Rotter, where he gets into like, the distinction between productive and unproductive versions of investment. And in particular talks about information as unproductive in capitalism because you're producing use values, but there's no obvious surplus value out the other side. And I think that's quite a, a critically important insight. And it's something you touched on, I think you're talking in the book, that these technologies aren't productive. You're producing ignorance. Uh, it's quite striking actually, when, when if you dig out capital, when Marx talks about why is a machine productive? It is productive because it's, it's kind of an encoding of what a human does, that you can sit down think about what you're doing and then encode that into a machine in some form. If you write a program conventionally, that's what you're doing. If you do a machine learning exercise, you're not doing that. You're just letting the machine learn, right? So you're not encoding knowledge uh, in quite the same way. So, so that's it's sort of built into that kind of Marxist view of what production looks like, what production is under capitalism in that it's an encoding of knowledge. This isn't what we're doing with this stuff. It's much more extractive. 
Uh, and there's a relationship, and, and perhaps you, you might want to touch on this, a relationship with that extraction of social knowledge with a turn towards the extraction of natural values themselves. There's a, a pool of, of value that we have is simply what we can suck out of nature. A pool of value that it turns out we have is what we can suck out of human society through these processes. And these two things look very, very similar. So anyway, that was um, a set of thoughts uh, on the book and on your presentation. As I said, I, I really enjoyed it. I think that there's a great deal to get your teeth into there. And I'd strongly recommend people pick it up and, and have a read themselves. Brilliant. Thanks for that, James. That's been really useful as well. That's generated a few some interesting questions and comments as well in the chat that I'm trying to follow. So hopefully that, people can rephrase those in a second and we'll come to audience questions in a minute. But I'll give Justin a chance to respond both to the points that Sonia raised um, um, and, and James as well. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Sonia and James, both for your, uh, your careful reading of the book and your, uh, your comments. I'll, I'll try to be brief so we can get to... Um, uh, to questions, but I, I did want to just say a couple of things. The first of which was, James, I, I think it, it's, I, I really appreciate you saying that you thought the book was short, because I think that's perhaps the, the highest praise I could hope for was that the book feels short, regardless of, because of, that would be the worst if it was a 20 page book and you read it on Kindle and thought it was 500 pages long or something like that. So, um, so I really appreciate you saying that it, it feels short. And I, I think actually in, in print, it's, it's just under 200 pages, I think. And, and, Big font, so it's it's not so bad, um, but it reads. It sounds like it it reads like a short book, so that's quite ideal. Um, as far as um, I really appreciated uh, Sonia, you sort of bringing out this um, this idea of of sort of this kind of becoming a sort of zero sum game, and I, I think it gets to this question too um, about whether or not this is actual production of knowledge or production of, of ignorance. Um, and while you were talking about it, I don't think this is in the book, but it, it reminds me of sort of kind of one of the um, uh, sort of canonical examples of uh, applied Bayesian analysis, which is spam filters, um, where you sort of detect all of these kind of these features in, a, in an email, um, and then you have a big corpus of email that is or is not spam, um, and you try to figure out what is the best evidence for something being or not being spam. And then, you know, as people are, are flagging spam, it, it updates and, and it learns um, and there's this kind of this arms race, essentially, that, you know, that that's been going on um, almost since the dawn of email uh, between spam and spam filters. Um, and it, it really just, to my mind, kind of encapsulates everything that you're thinking about, that it's, it's this very kind of like unproductive uh, use of everyone's time, but there's obviously there's there's money to be made in spamming people and there's money to be made in in blocking spam. And so it, it just goes back and forth. And um, I especially remember the, the days, it must've been in the early 2000s when you used to get spam emails that had like large passages of Anna Karenina like copied and pasted at the bottom to try to get past the um, the spam filters. And maybe we, maybe maybe I learned something from those because I would always take the time to read the, the Tolstoy or whatever it was the or Melville passage that was at the bottom of them. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I just think that was a, a really important point and I appreciate you, you bringing it up. Um, and then also, uh, you know, I, I think it is interesting to sort of think about this book in relation to my work as, as a librarian and as a data viz librarian, because um, we've sort of in the library kind of had ongoing and extensive conversations about, um, you know, data sets and negative results and how, you know, the, the sort of the collection of the, the output of the scholarly record can be fed back in to produce uh, more knowledge. And in a lot of ways, these sort of these questions um, that I brought to writing the book about frequentism and Bayesian statistics uh, come from that sort of those kind of discussions and those discussions about how, um, how knowledge is produced in, in and beyond the academy. And, and then also this sort of uh, the, the kind of thinking about stories and the importance of, of stories for kind of understanding these processes um, and reflecting on them. And I think one of the things, you know, that really sort of has struck me in, in thinking about this sort of this kind of this Fisherian frequentist approach and the move to this sort of this more kind of fluid, mobile, constantly updating Bayesian approach is that I think one of the, the real dangers is that, that sort of the, the knowledge production and the economies that underlie it are moving to these much more kind of mobile, constantly updating systems. But then when we sort of, when 
those systems are re-entered into kind of you know human imagination and the stories we tell um, and the stories we hear, we have this tendency, I think, to sort of reintroduce this kind of Fisherian understanding of it, right? That these things that appear as these momentary correlations then are sort of given this kind of full weight. And I, I think that there, there's something going on there and, and I, I need to think about it more. But I think about, you know, I think there's there's something about that and the relation to the kind of return of these sort of old forms of um, racism and sexism that we hear in terms of, uh, you know, the renewed interest in in race science and, and all the anti-trans, you know, like the legislation that just came out of Texas um, and uh, the sort of return to, I don't know if return's the right word, um, but the sort of the, the growing force of, of these very, I think in a lot of ways, kind of Fisherian theories of, of enduring difference between race and, and gender um, and sex. And, and something there seems very, very dangerous to me. And, and maybe to get at the heart of what objectification is, is it's these sort of mobile kind of constantly shifting uh, economic and social things that are then given this sort of this kind of this veneer of eternal truth. Um, and it seems uh, to be sort of the worst of both worlds in, in a certain sense. Um, and, and so I think that's a that and, and just thinking through the kind of the stories that we tell um, is, is really important. Um, and then and then finally, before I open it for questions, I do want to uh, sort of address, James, what you were saying about this question of, of, you know, whether or not this really is knowledge production. And, and I think that that we're uh, likely in, in quite close agreement on this, aside from maybe one, one sort of small element of it. I think you're absolutely right that these sort of systems are becoming increasingly useless and sort of becoming these kind of uh, uh, adversarial systems, right? Where, where exactly like Sonia said, quoted or from the book, that it no longer becomes about knowing absolutely more, but only knowing um, a little bit, a little bit of difference between the other party, right? And so it's about uh, sort of, it's just about, it's as much about impoverishing the other's knowledge as it is about increasing one's own knowledge. Um, and so you end up with this sort of, you know, these derivatives markets where things are responding to other things, responding to small uh, glitches in, in computer systems and sort of constantly kind of chasing this tail of, um, of knowledge production and dissimulation. And so I think in a lot of ways, it, it, it becomes, like you said, the production of ignorance. It becomes sort of non-useful information. Um, but to my mind, the sort of, and the sort of the problem isn't so much in the sort of the necessarily the kind of the speed, the way that these systems work, the fact that we can't uh, necessarily kind of understand in a rational sense what they're doing, um, you know, and, and I might be um, showing my sort of Derridian uh, deconstructionist uh, uh, kind of uh, um, history in my own sort of thinking. But I think that the problem is, is less the sort of we don't understand what's going on in these systems and much more the larger economic systems that are producing this sort of this kind of these, you know, uh, negative sum games where, where knowledge production gets subsumed to this. So I think my sort of my hopeful takeaway from the book is that some of these systems um, you know, it's possible to potentially use them in different ways. And that's sort of where I get at this idea of when I say a different objectification is possible. That the, the sort of the problem is, is not so much the, the fact that these systems can think faster or at, on larger sets of data than we can, but more to do with the systems of value that they're ultimately plugged into. That these are the systems that are, are ultimately, you know, responsible for sort of producing this kind of the, the continued ignorance. Um, I talk in the book sort of about the, um, the sort of enclosure of the general intellect, right? That it becomes, that knowledge gets sort of parceled out and becomes sort of weaponized. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, that, that even though, you know, I, I wouldn't disagree that there, there are challenges to these systems being these sort of closed, uh, obfuscated things that we can't really audit. But I, I think to my mind, the much bigger issue is the sort of the way that knowledge is being kind of parceled out and, and being uh, weaponized. Brilliant. Um, I'll turn over to audience questions in a second, but just to, I'm, I'm going to use my privilege just to jump sort of back in on that final point, because I'm trying to think about some of the other literature, maybe about the sort of, of um, contemporary knowledge production, the way it's, and our, our approaches to it. I mean, would you say, 
as you were saying there, your, your approach maybe makes that distinction from someone like James Bridal. So I'm thinking of New Dark Age, which maybe takes the, that, that alternative tack, right, of these of being maybe something inherently problematic in the alienating, clouding tendencies of these technologies, whereas potentially you're trying to push towards sort of retaining the necessity of that push towards objectification, alienation, and so on, right? Am I reading you clearly maybe as someone who's an outsider in that respect? Yeah, I think so. And I think that's sort of, you know, kind of where the, the book ends up is, is this idea um, that it that the problem with kind of alienation, with the fact that these systems sort of think for us, that they objectify our thought, isn't necessarily that 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 act in and of itself is a is a negative one. Um, you know, I, I write a little bit about this uh, this mathematician who kind of developed this this system for answering a specific question, and uh, and no one but like a few grad students understand what it is that he's he's doing. And and I think that there's there's in fact a lot to be said, something very positive about sort of systems thinking for us and and sort of unburdening us, and and it has. To my mind, the, the problem is, is less the sort of the, the formal structure of alienation or objectification, but the specific values and the, the sort of the social assumptions and the long histories of um, racism and sexism and ableism that get encoded into those systems. Um, so I, I think, yes, you're, you're absolutely right in your, your reading of that. Brilliant. Um, so people, um, so please do keep the questions coming in in the chat and feel free to raise your hand function as well. But the first, first question, which uh, I think talks talk some of the language used in the book, particularly, and you talked about Fisher and eugenics earlier too, and potential ways in which um, Bayesian probability is intersected with some of these, um, with contemporary forms of uh, um, domination and oppression and so on. So the first one was, which is more concerning? Uh, uh, Bashir and eugenics or Bayesian necropolitics. Um, have you got a, have you got a, have you got any thoughts on that initially, Justin? And then um, I'll open to James and Sonia if they've got any thoughts too. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Dan. It's it's very succinct, but I think incredibly important and and gets said a lot. Um, and I, I think, you know, my answer would be that that to some extent it's both. And I think that's what, what I was sort of trying to get at um, before is that there's there's a really concerning way in which these things are sort of intertwined, um, that we get the sort of the the kind of the belief in the kind of enduring truths of these categories that, you know, that we see in this sort of his, history of Fisherian um, eugenics. Um, and then sort of married to the, the kind of the mobile Bayesian necropolitics. And so um, you get this system where, you know, the, the sort of the, the victims of these, these types of actions and oppression and domination um, have no recourse to the, the kind of the, the sort of enduring, um, you know, sort of systems of knowledge that they can say, wait a second, you know, this is this is wrong, something has to be done about it. Um, but then they're also kind of constantly sort of pushed through these sort of these modulations. Um, and, and it means essentially, I, I think what, what ends up happening, if, if I can, can sort of be a little reductive about it, is that the people in power have access to the kind of the, the discourse of these enduring sort of categories and can use and weaponize them in, in any way that they see fit. Whereas then the sort of the, the, the victims of, of domination and oppression are, are left with, you know, this sort of with nothing to, to stand on. Um, and, you know, and to some extent, I think it gets back to, you know, just to give sort of a, a simple example of uh, something that I mentioned earlier, you know, if you think about uh, MIDAS, the system in Michigan um, for, uh, for unemployment fraud, right, that, you know, it, it's sort of based on this idea, right, that like all of these poor people are trying to, to defraud the system, that everyone's a cheat and they need to be detected and punished. And then when it actually, you know, when it detects these 40,000 people, um, there's there's no sort of, you know, uh, sort of system to go back and say, wait, this is this is wrong. And so um, the the sort of the people on the, the receiving end of this domination end up with, I think, the the worst of, of both worlds in a, in a certain sense. Right. Um, is there anything that James or Sonia wanted to particularly add on that point at all? Or um, otherwise, I'll ask. I mean, it's I guess it's a related question, which really um, possibly sort of 
uh, leads on from that previous one in terms of questioning the some of how useful maybe these distinctions therefore are between uh, so uh, the Bayesian and frequent, frequentist uh, approaches to probability rights. So yes, yeah, so the question was to what extent has this project shown up the way in which that this distinction itself between Bayesian and frequentist, frequentism might be actually useful to making sense of this history and I guess way it relates to production and so on. Yeah, thanks for that question, Michael. I think it's it's a really interesting one. And, and one I think I, I hadn't quite thought about in precisely those terms, but I, I think now that you mention it, I think that there's a um, there's something really interesting that I found in thinking about Neyman and Pearson, who are sort of this kind of this, this bridge between uh, the sort of the strict Fisherian interpretation of frequentism and then Bayesian statistics as understood by Leonard Savage. And, and I read that quote. Uh, where Savage speaks quite fondly um, about the work of Neyman and Pearson and their sort of understanding um, that this is kind of an economic calculation, that it's not, as he says, um, a question about uh, what to say, but a question of, of what to do. And so I think you're right that there's that this sort of, this history does sort of pull apart some of those distinctions. And, and maybe the, the sort of the more interesting um, distinction is, is like you say, less between a, a sort of a strict Bayesian understanding and a frequentist one, and one that's much more uh, sort of this ongoing fight between um, knowledge as something that exists outside of economy and knowledge as something that's produced um, through and by political economy. Well, that's really good. One thing I think about in that is, um, is maybe there's another distinction that uh, Matt Jones has pulled from the history of uh, machine learning, which is the sort of positivist instrumentalist distinction um, as another sort of layer of um, the way the ontology of, uh, of information gets filtered through these different kinds of, of ways of producing calculative rationality. Um, but I think that maps in some interesting ways with the categories you're working with. And then the other thing that really struck me in your presentation was how um, some questions about the relationship between technology and epistemology um, might sort of open up some interesting uh, tensions or, or, or um, yeah, other ways of viewing this, this distinction that we've, I think we've all learned to take for granted in some, in some ways that are themselves worth historicizing. Yeah, and you know, and I just add to that. I think one of the things that I, when I started doing this research, that I didn't really expect. Maybe I mean, maybe everyone else knows this, but me. Um, but I was surprised to find that when you read um, Fisher's early work about frequentism, it starts with him essentially attacking Bayesian statistics. He there's a there's a whole section where he writes about the problems of. Uh, uh, inverse probability, which is what he calls, you know, what we know as, as Bayesian statistics. And I, I think, you know, to, to my sort of, my kind of understanding of the history before I really dug into it was, you know, that there was classical probability and then, uh, you know, this sort of gets developed and developed and then, uh, and then you have kind of frequentism and then Bayesian statistics sort of was kind of, you know, lurking in the background and then finally explodes in the in the 80s. Um, so it was really interesting for me to see that that in a lot of ways, it was sort of understood as the way in which one would do uh, statistics prior to uh, to Fisher's work. Can I Thanks. jump in? Sorry, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, because just just whilst you're talking, there's the other, I mean, it, it, it's not the, the book is, is a different creature to this, but there's a sort of parallel history of, of computing and the technology that makes this this viable in the first place. That, that you know, there are people who do sort of radical uh, reinterpretations. What what it, what is a computer and what is the history of computing? What is the history of the technology here? And there's a whole load of roads not taken one way or the other. I mean, the, the, the reason we have these vast amounts of data that can be processed in this form is because we've all ended up with a little box that we carry around all over the place with a huge amount of sophisticated uh, monitoring technology that will report this data. That, that's a very particular form of the technology that, that enables this to happen. And it's quite a material uh, impact on how the statistics itself is being developed, why there's all this money going into this version of statistics. It's in part because we also have the technology that makes this statistics meaningful. If we had, if we step back probably at least 30 or 40 years now and had computers that were developed in a different way and for different purposes, that were, that were closer to some of these 
you know, they're somewhat forgotten figures back in a history of computing where it wasn't just here is a box that will monitor everything and turn it into money. You know, that you get back to a version of computing looks like this. That people talking now about uh, things like perma computing. How can you make computing as as small and as understandable to a human as possible, rather than vast machines that you don't understand? You'd have a different version of that technology and, and a different version of statistics that we'd be using to make that technology work. I think at that point. Justin, did you want to respond to that? Or Sonia, have you have you got anything you wanted to jump in on? Uh, no, just I was just reminded when Michael made the point about the uh, epistemology and technology, it just reminded me, it could be one of you here who actually tweeted this the other day, which is uh, about uh, looking at some some a brain imaging study that like how much of this is about how the brain actually works and how much of it is about how much we can do with the Fourier transform. So, you know, I, I think that kind of really encapsulates, um, yeah, that, that, po that point of this. Sure, brilliant. Uh, J Julian, um, do you want to uh, ask, ask a question? You should be able to unmute yourself, but I can unmute you too. <laughs> right, I, think, I hope you can hear me now. Um, yes, that's great. Uh, my, my question, which I, I might have to explain, is some um, exactly what your intended audience for the book is I and mean, who who are you kind of in, you know when when you type the words into the computer who who were you who did you envisage they were addressed to and to explain um i mean first of all i only got my copy a couple of days ago so i've only read part one um and i found that was very helpful in the way it related <clears throat> marx's notion of objectification to what goes on in um artificial intelligence. Um, I'm looking forward to part two because I've never really understood uh, the controversy between frequentism and Bayesianism. A very long time ago, I did a course in um, philosophy of probability and the, all the interpretations of probability seemed usefully applicable in, a, in an appropriate domain. Um, but to come to my question, on the basis of chapters two and three, I think that's a really useful book, but I have to say that I found chapter one completely unreadable. Um, it appears to be um, uh, aimed at uh, followers of postmodern philosophy, um, something which I know very little about and most people know nothing about. And I wonder whether that's really an audience that's worth arguing with, given the comprehensive way they embarrass themselves as revealed by Alan, as exposed by Alan Sokol, when it comes to talking about anything uh, technical or scientific. That's not a question. Who, who's, who are you addressing? Okay. Brilliant, thank you, Julian. Sure, uh, yeah, no, no I'm, I'm happy. I actually, I, I love to talk about uh, Alan Sokol. Uh, I think I, I've actually thought about that a lot when um, writing this book. I, I am a little confused. I feel like chapter one is just sort of an explanation of, of how neural networks work. Um, so I wonder if, I don't know, maybe you're talking about the introduction. Um, but uh, regardless, I think, you know, my sort of my intended audience um, was a number of people. So I, I think it was, you know, in, in some ways, first and foremost, my colleagues in media studies who are interested in algorithms and the relationship between algorithms and society um, to, you know, to sort of really open up this kind of this question about probability and the relationship of probability um, to the questions of uh, media studies. And then I think it was also, it was generally to um, a group of, you know, kind of leftists who were interested in technology, some of whom I imagine, you know, kind of uh, work in technology and, and some who maybe don't necessarily work in technology. Um, but it was really sort of to, to try to give people a kind of a language to think about the relationship between political economy um, and, and algorithms. And I think the really interesting thing to me about the 
the Sokol ho hoax, the Sokol affair, is I oftentimes say in a lot of ways, you know, if you look at everything that's going on in the sciences with um, falsified data, redacted papers, predatory journals, that I think in, in a lot of ways, the, the Sokol affair had less to do with postmodernism. Um, and it was sort of a, a dry run for the crises of the sciences more than it had anything really to do um, with the crises of the, the humanities. Um, and I think it, it really sort of gets to the fact that, you know, when people sort of think about these kind of the, the forms of knowledge production as, um, adversarial as places where people can extract value, whether that's personal prestige within the university or the sort of direct um, production of, of you know, monetary value, um, that you see that many of these institutions are incredibly weak um, in terms of protecting themselves against these things. And in a lot of ways were designed um, explicitly so, you know, and, and you see sort of the same thing now happening with, uh, I forget their names, and it's probably not even worth mentioning, but these three researchers who, uh, you know, submitted something about critical race theory. Um, and so I, I think that there actually is something really interesting going on uh, with the Sokol hoax, but I, I feel like it's much less about postmodernism and the humanities than it, than it is about uh, knowledge production writ large. Real. Um, there's a there's a further question which uh, comes from AG asking if you have an opinion on the work of uh, Ellie Ayache, I might be fancy my name wrong, so I apologize if I, if I am, and his notion of, um, of the end of probability. Um, Justin, I don't know if you do or if you have anything to say, but yeah. Yeah, actually, so uh, AG, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, unmuting, and, and I was actually talking to a grad student even last week about this book, but I, I have such bad pandemic brain right now. I, I, I'm having trouble remembering exactly what it was that we said. So if, if you're able to unmute or even just type in the chat, uh, if you'd be willing to maybe just summarize it real quick for everyone, I'm sure I could remember what it was that I thought about it. Uh, that's fine, we're in a public space so I really can't unmute unfortunately, but uh, that's, so yeah. That, Yeah, I, I, can, I think, you know, uh, to, maybe I should just, just leave it, but I, I think if I remember the conversation we were having, I think in a lot of ways, um, right, right, it's the blank swan one. Um, and I think to some extent it gets to the conversation uh, that James sort of opened up about, you know, whether or not sort of things have uh, gotten to a point where they've sort of gone so far off the rails that they're sort of producing uh, continued um, uh producing ignorance rather than than knowledge. And, and I think, you know, to that extent, I, I think that there really is sort of something there to that argument, but I, I think it's not um, necessarily on the sort of the kind of, let's say the ontological level, right? The level that that it's, it's we're hopelessly lost, but that it really is in a lot of ways, um, I think fundamentally a, a sort of a crisis of capitalism and its relationship to knowledge production. Well, um, uh... Is there anything that James or Sonia want to jump back um, back up on at all there? It's fine. Um, we were going to give, give it around an hour and a half for the event. So if anyone has any final questions, feel free to get them in quickly now uh, while we still have time. Brill. OK, in that case, I'll hand over to, um, to Jack. Hi. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to um... Like, it seems to me that a lot of like contemporary machine learning algorithms don't, like, as you say, use optimization procedures rather than um, Bayesian procedures. Um, could you um, explain, I, I wasn't clear from your talk, I haven't read your book, sorry, but um, what, what, how you think like Bayesian statistics has some, I don't know, like some different kind of properties to it that that have some some social effects I wasn't so clear on why the focus was on specifically based in statistics rather than like the range of statistical procedures out there sure I think that yeah that's a, a really good question and I, I think it has to do with 
the fact that sort of historically, you know, when you see the kind of there's there's and this is this is actually one of the things that I talk about in the in the first chapter. Um, there is sort of, you know, in, in the early kind of post-war period, artificial intelligence is really based on symbolic logics and this idea, you know, that we can sort of create fundamental ontologies to, to put these systems together. And this sort of falls apart in the, the kind of the AI winter. And then you see this sort of this, this growing interest in kind of probabilistic approaches in artificial intelligence. And in a lot of ways, this was sort of driven, I think, by the kind of the rise of Bayesian statistics. You get things like the naive Bayes classifier, um, you know, which is used for spam filters. There's a, at some point, there was some interview I read uh, with one of the uh, head engineers at Google saying that, you know, oftentimes they start um, these projects and they just throw in a, a naive Bayes classifier thinking they'll come back and do something more complicated. And it turns out to, to work really, really well. So, you know, like you said, obviously this isn't the only sort of statistical or machine learning uh, algorithm um, that's being used, but I think in a lot of ways it, it kind of, it underlies the sort of the, the commitment to a, a certain way of thinking about probabilistic knowledge. Um, and even, you know, I think even beyond sort of the, the sort of the specifics of Bayesian statistics, you know, I think tracing uh, the, the, the work of, of um, Neyman and Pearson, there's this sort of this growing kind of uh, economicization of knowledge production. Um, and even if you think about, you know, optimization functions, these kind of things, they're, they're also sort of ways essentially to tie knowledge production to um, trying to kind of, you know, make the most economical uh, choice and produce the most profit. So I think it's it sort of, it gets its kind of, its full philosophical depth in the works of, of Savage. And he draws earlier on the works of uh, uh, Di Finetti from the 30s um, and Neyman and Pearson. And, and so, um, it's less that the point is like, oh, 70% of algorithms use Bayesian statistics. And it's more that um, that really this is, I think, where this philosophy um, that we see in sort of all of these approaches is kind of developed in its full depth. Brilliant. I think there's potentially, oh, um, I'll really quickly, maybe we do have a really quick time for, for two last questions, then very quickly. Now everyone's keen to get them in, which is great. So the first one um, is from Ollie, which came in the chat, which was, um, why do you think the knowledge production problem links particularly to capitalism uh, rather than more generally? Uh, and in what way could another mode of organizing our political economy help solve this deep epistemological problem? Uh, and then should we maybe, should I take uh, Eleanor's question as well at the same time and we can see if there's any overlap or if um, we can answer both. So yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. Um, I think we're having a... We can't currently hear you. Sorry, you you are unmuted, but there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. that's great. Thanks. So, what would be then the the correct uh, maths to use, for instance, for the socialist economic calculation problem? Wouldn't uh, these kind of statistics have any position there? At all, I know it's linear programming mainly used optimization techniques, but what about this? Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, I think that, that does. So I was going to say, I think that maps on well to the question we got in the chat too. So it's this question of you know looking forward into alternative modes of knowledge production and statistics. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think in a lot of ways, right, these two questions are are very closely um, related, and I think you know. So I think not to sort of. Uh, come down so strongly on the like the claim that we definitely need a sort of a planned centrally organized economy that's that's not really my point i think it's it's much more of an, an open question than that. But I think one of the things that's really interesting is especially if you look at the work of um, Neyman and Pearson and the sort of the early stages of this kind of this realization that um, this sort of statistical knowledge production was economic, is that a lot of sort of what they're talking about is specifically systems where there's a plant manager or there's a five-year plan or there are sort of systems to kind of um, you know, not necessarily centrally uh, direct knowledge production, but that knowledge production is sort of more organizationally managed than it is, you know, in on sort of uh, capitalism. 
as we know it um, now. And in fact, this is one of the things that Fisher really like attacks Naaman and Pearson for. Um, he, they get like, they spend decades kind of attacking each other throughout the uh, statistical literature. And he says, you know, like really the way you're approaching it is like as Soviets, you wanna, you know, like you wanna have some sort of technology that manages everything. And, you know, and he's like, I believe in the kind of the heroic scientist who should learn things for themselves. Um, and so, you know, not necessarily that to say that we need a, a sort of a Soviet model of a, a planned economy, um, but that I, I think that, you know, that, that we need some sort of, you know, uh, democratic sort of collective uh, communal control over knowledge production and exactly what that means, um, you know, I think is, is, is complicated work to figure out and, and I don't want to claim that I have, have any idea uh, what the proper answer for it is, but that that's something, you know, that, that sort of moves away from this kind of this adversarial uh, system in which it's sort of all of these, you know, heroic lone scientists or capitalists fighting each other um, to have just a little bit more knowledge to skim a little bit more off of an individual contract um, is, I believe, the direction you know that we need to go, and and that doesn't, I think, necessarily mean um, abandoning Bayesian statistics, but it means sort of changing the systems of value to which it's plugged into and the ways in which knowledge production is planned and managed and organized. And I'll yeah, turn it over to James. Yeah, I thought that was, um, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly kind of dredging this up from, from a, a PhD really some years ago, but but the the it, it strikes me that the, the criticism of Bayesian statistics would not apply to the socialist calculation debate in, in two senses. One is that if you treat the socialist calculation debate as a problem really in optimization linear programming, which is how people tend to tend to sort of end up trying to, to, to demonstrate this thing, th this is a deterministic system with an error attached to it. You say, here's a system, this is where we know if we do this thing here, we put in this value here, you definitely get this output there, and then there's maybe an error on top. So it's basically mostly deterministic, and your job is to get rid of the error term to make that as small as possible. It's, it's not the same thing as a Bayesian system where actually lots of error is good because this is more data and therefore you can get uh, something else out the other side. You're, you're gathering as much as possible. So, so the problem looks different. Uh, and then it, it looks different potentially on, on the other side, which is... It is it's something like the, the issue, and this applies to your, your basic sort of bourgeois economics as well, your, your standard neoclassical mainstream economics, in that your, your basic result, which is that why is the capitalist economy good? Why, how can it function? It's because it will reach general equilibrium, is setting up a non-computable problem. And, it, and it's widely known to be non-computable, that general equilibrium is not a computable problem. You cannot make a computer solve this, this uh, given the conditions that you establish for how it should be solved. But you can do it analytically. Uh, and you can grind a big spreadsheet, not even that big actually, and kind of get there. But formally, the problem is not a solvable one. You can only sort of do it as an empirical issue. So, so it's sort of it feels like what we've ended up in is something that's quite a long way from those earlier versions of computing into something quite different, and into a versions of the machines and how we organise society and the economy using this version of statistics is not something that if you'd sat in the well under the socialist calculation debate uh in the 20s and 30s 30s uh or moving to the 60s when you actually have computers that might plausibly do this uh, and if people have read um francis spufford's read plenty of course it's a sort of very good novelistic treatment of what might go wrong if you try and actually plan like this uh, that we've moved into something different and not necessarily something better or something that can simply be taken and used and that i think is there's a degree of, of a challenge here that, uh, what's the book? Um, the People's Republic of Walmart uh, came out a couple of years ago by Lee Phillips and, and his co-author, his name suddenly, Michael uh, Roshulski, um, which basically says we can just take the machinery and turn it into something else. Now, if what we're dealing with is computers that are set up to run in the way that we have computers set up, these may well be, and I think this is more or less where your book ends up, Justin, this may well be simply impossible to just take over. Right, it's not like the old Lenin thing of they've given us all this machinery. It's just accountancy now to to manage society. That there's something far worse that's happened, and it's going to be far harder to try and make that run in a in a socially progressive or, or even vaguely democratic fashion. Yes, yeah, I think that that's great, and yeah, thanks so much for uh, for that. 
uh, James, and I think you're absolutely right. It's it's not a, a sort of an easy problem to solve because it's it's fundamentally tied to these very complicated uh, metaphysics of, of value um, and probability. And, and the only thing I'd add is one thing I talk about in the book is how, uh, and it sort of ties back to this discussion of, of knowledge production and statistics not working, is that I, I think what we've run into with a lot of these sort of systems now is, is a capitalist calculation problem, that it, it's sort of producing the sort of the corollary to, you know, this, the, the sort of uh, um, debate about the socialist calculation problem, that capitalism is now producing knowledge in drastically different ways than it was in the 20s or 30s, and, and that capitalism is, is really running into this crisis of calculating um, and distri calculating distribution and, and optimizing these things. Not to say that it ever did a, a great job, but it's managing to do uh, even worse. Brilliant. Um, unless uh, any of our panel have anything final they really want to quickly add uh, at all, or are they, are they happy? In that case, uh, otherwise, I might we might use that as a great opportunity to finish and, and uh, wrap up for this evening. Um, I'm really, really grateful again to for Justin, uh, Sonia, and James, um, uh, our speaker on our panel, for coming along. Thanks, everyone, for participating. It's been really great to have such a lively discussion, both in the chat and afterwards. It's really helped. Uh, bring up a lot of interesting ideas. I'd say the book, you know, as as, as uh, James, I think, said at the start, the book is a really rich book. And as it feels like there's so many strands of thought, we've only just managed to scratch scratch the surface of here. So definitely uh, get yourselves over to the Verso site and pick up the book if you haven't uh, already, for sure. Um, it's a really great read. So yeah, on behalf of I'm sure everyone and Autonomy, thanks again to Justin and the panel. And um, uh, we'll hopefully upload the event uh soon to the youtube channel so it can be watched back or other people can catch up with it but um yeah brilliant thanks uh, thanks a lot everyone and uh we'll hopefully see you at our next autonomy event soon brilliant bye, -bye. thanks